Considering all she has been through, the explosion, and more than half a century underwater, the vessel is still remarkably intact. Resting on one side, most of her features are still identifiable. The base of a jib, which in normal times would have been used for loading rubber from Malaysia, tea from India or silk from China, now lies motionless. With one of the nearby winches, it has not worked any cargo for over half a century. A motor and gearbox produced by some unknown manufacturer but still recognisable. The vessel, settled as it is on one side, creates a false perspective. An unusually shaped object takes on the more familiar shape of a ventilator and what initially seems like a very wide window is really a door. The machinery contained inside long since ceased to be recognisable. Parts of the wooden decking still survive in remarkable condition. And standing on the forecastle is the windlass with the chain clearly visible, running through the horse pipe and down to where the anchor, long since removed, would have lain on the seabed. The chain stretched out in this way poses an interesting question. Could it be, in fact, she was not drifting helplessly, but that she was anchored when she exploded and sank? And if she was anchored, what of the fate of those brave men who operated the windlass? With the records incomplete, all we can do now is ponder the question. The four-inch bow guns were for defence against lightly armoured surface vessels, including any submarine unwary enough to be on the surface. Rust and the passage of time are taking their toll, and the funnel, weakened by the explosion, now lies detached from the remains of the superstructure. The midship section has sustained the greatest damage, suggesting that the explosion occurred in the engine room. The force being directed upwards and contained laterally by the forward and after engine room bulkheads, which probably explains why the mines never exploded. A capstan last used to bring the vessel alongside the pier on that fateful day. Nearby, wrapped around a set of bollards, are the ropes that were placed there in 1940, leading to the fair lead and through them to the shore. What happened to the sailor who coiled these ropes half a century ago? Away from the midship section, the damage is much less severe, and although showing the passage of time, there is no evidence of any explosion. When operating at sea, the method of laying the mines was simple. Each mine was mounted on a trolley to form an integrated unit. Mine and trolley were transferred from their storage in the holes to the stern deployment doors using a system of rails in what was an effective shipboard railway system. The mine was connected to its trolley by a restraining cable. The final act before deployment 
was to remove the jacking screw which prevented the mine accidentally arming itself. They were then dropped in a pattern from the stern with the ship still travelling at maximum speed, thus eliminating the need for the vessel to slow down, which would have exposed it to greater risks from lurking enemy submarines. This was 1940 and the U-boats were at their greatest concentration. Once in the water, the trolley acted as the sinker and the connecting cable ensured the mine floated at a predetermined depth to lay in wait for an unsuspecting vessel. The top plating of this trolley has rusted away to reveal the drum from which the mine retaining cable would have reeled out to a length appropriate to the depth at which the mine floated. In the years since she sank, the ship has metamorphosed into an artificial reef supporting a variety of marine life. Long strands of kelp grow near the surface down to a depth of 15 feet. Lower down they are replaced by other growths such as soft corals and sea anemones. With the passage of time, an instrument of destruction has become merely another sunken vessel, albeit one with a small place in history, providing an interesting dive to the visiting divers. Just one of Scotland's many outstanding wrecks. With the war over, the towns of Kyleekin and Kyle of Lockhouse quickly reverted to their peacetime role of being the terminals for the ferry to Sky. Tens of thousands of people make that crossing today. Their thoughts on the romantic story of Bonnie Prince Charlie and Flora MacDonald. But of all those thousands, as they look back to the mainland, I wonder how many of them realise that but for the brave deeds of a handful of seamen in 1940, the view they see could have been very, very different.